which makes it Lancaster Wood Turner's uh, weekly coffee hour. Um, and this morning we have a guest star. Uh, before we go, to, it was Mark Sphere. Before we go to that, though, I'm going to uh, let's see a couple of announcements. Um, this is a, this is not a show and tell morning, so we're going to Mark is going to do a slideshow. Um, let me see. The only announcement I want to make is that on Saturday the club is having an open shop at the uh, New Holland Studio. That'll be from nine till noon or one, depending on how long people want to hang out. I think Barry will be there, and I'm, I may be there if I can make it. And I think uh, Ben will be there, and I'm not sure who else. <clears throat> but last time we had about a dozen in attendance, so that's what we expect there. Um, I don't have any other announcements. Uh, this is a weekly coffee hour, and we do have a guest star, and that's Mark Sphere. Mark is our uh, neighbor. In uh, Mark lives in Paoli uh, and is a member of Buckwood. New Hope. Yeah. New Hope. And Paoli is for Wharton Ashrick. Okay. Well, you can tell us all about that once yeah. I give you the whole floor. Um, I was going to do a bit of a prepared intro, but I lost a piece of paper I had it on. So I, <laughs> let me just say that Mark um, has been a teacher at Bucks. Is it community college or is it a university now? Uh, Bucks County Community College. Bucks yeah. County Community College and established the workshop there then generations ago and um, ran it for very many years, producing a training an awful lot of woodworkers in a program that uh, was kind of snuck in under the radar um, and has also won a, the, the Renwick, was it the Renwick's Distinguished Teacher of the Year Award? Uh, educator, yeah. Educator of the Year, 2012, educator. I think it was. Yeah, and is now retired from teaching, um, but is also very well known for multi-axis wood turning and some very innovative wood turning using uh, traditional furniture forms with turnings that are not at all traditional, which he'll show us in the slideshow that we're going we're to start now. So um, over to you, Mark. Okay, so now I have to share screen. I think that's it. Okay. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's see. I need to do one other thing here. Mark's going to run his slideshow and talk for well, maybe half an hour, and then we're going to go to questions, and we'll be able to go back to any slide you want and re and dig into questions. So keep track of your questions. Uh, he'll he, he he's afraid he'll lose his thread if we uh, interrupt him as he goes. So so that's how we're going to play it this morning. Okay, thank you, John, and thank you all for attending. Uh, my brief history is that I went to Rhode Island School of Design in the 1970s. Um, spent three years working in an office furniture manufacturer in uh, Rochester, New York as director of design and engineering. Um, and then 37 years teaching and running the fine woodworking program at Bucks County Community College in Newtown, PA, um, while also maintaining my own shop for making furniture and sculptural objects. I always felt that being deeply involved in making was critical to my teaching and vice versa. Me. Um, this is my shop. It's actually on my property, which was, it was great. It's a 900 square foot uh, building that formerly was a kennel. And, um, and if I didn't mention, I live near New Hope, uh, Pennsylvania. Since I do make furniture, I have the requisite machines to process wood, like in, in this case, a table saw that's loaded, <laughs> that's a storage area right at the moment, uh, jointer, planer, bandsaw, drill press, those sorts of things. So most of the machines are in the lower portion of the shop, and then there's a step up, and then the upper portion is my uh, uh, bench area and uh, lathe area. So I'm going to, next shot is looking, turning around and looking back, and um, I have a lot of hand tools, and I'm pretty organized with them. Um, here are 42 drawers with full extension runners in a cabinet that I built years ago. And to show you some of the organization, um, you know, I was just sick and tired of having bits on top of one another getting chipped and dinged. So here's my router bit drawer and then my uh, large drill bit uh, drawer. Um, one thing I wanted to point out though is um, most of the shanks in the here are half inch and most of these are quarter inch. If you drill a half inch hole, um, every time you take a router bit in and out, especially if it's sharp, you're going to cut yourself. So I managed to find a 33 64 drill bit, which I use solely for this purpose. And so that's 1 64th over half inch. So everything comes in and out easily. Quarter inch is easier, 17 64 They're pretty readily available. 
So anyway, just a little, little tip there. Um, so there's that cabinet in the background on the left hand and the slide here. And here's my one way lathe that starts here and it ends down here somewhere. So I have a one way with a bed extension and another bed extension. So I can turn up to uh, 11 feet. Not that I've used it that often for that, but um, I have used, I've turned a 10 and a half foot piece. Right across from the one way is my latest purchase, which is a robust lathe I got in 2019 um, with the extended bed, which I absolutely love. And, um, and here's another tip. If you're gonna buy another lathe, particularly in this case, uh, there is the opportunity to uh, specify the threading of the spindle. And, um, you know, they have their own threading for their chucks and whatnot. But I already had everything to the one-way specs, all my face plates, all my chucks, and I made the uh, brilliant decision to just have it threaded like a one-way. So it was very cost saving and storage saving. And I think I spent an extra $50 to have that done. So, so I can use them on uh, either lathe. Um, Tay Frid, uh, you might know from uh, fine, early fine woodworking days, he was a uh, contributing editor to that magazine. In fact, I was in the Rhode Island School of Design shop when John Kelsey came representing uh, fine woodworking to talk to talk, try to talk for it into being a part of the magazine, whenever that was, John, I don't know, 74, 75, something like that, 76. 75 or six, I think. Yeah. So he was my teacher, he was my mentor, friend, and he was my boss uh, for, for most of the 70s. I was a student of his and then I worked for him in his own shop. And then I got a, he got, well, I got a job at the uh, RISD shop running it. Um, and then I ended up getting my master's degree there. So this photo was in the early uh, 80s uh, when he visited me and that's my studio or shop in the background. This is an image of me. 50 years ago, while a student in my second year at RISD. And um, of all the pieces, of all the wood pieces from college, this is one of my favorites. Um, it's nearly entirely carved. There's some router work in it, but it's mostly carved. And, you know, you can see there's bilateral symmetry in, in two directions, uh, horizontally and vertically. And so I had to make a little template so that I can draw this out and, and do the shaping and the carving of it. And, um, you know, I was pleased with the way it came out. This is about, if I had to guess, about 15 inches wide by about 24 uh, long, one piece of uh, beautiful mahogany. Um, it was juried into the Young Americans exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Craft in New York City, which was a huge honor. But um, after that, uh, Fred did his demo of turning and, um, which I have to say, it included faceplate turning, spindle turning, and even a little bit of multi-axis turning, making sort of a triangular section, you know, by doing three sets of centers. And, and all of that took about an hour to do his complete turning demo. Of course, it was scraping tools for most faceplate things, and there were some edge tools, but, you know, pretty pathetic in, in terms of what's available today. Um, so, Anyway, I, I saw this uh, turning as a possibility of helping and uh, combining turning with uh, faceplate turning. So this was a drawing that I did, and I, I tend to use my sketchbook a lot, especially back then. Um, less so now, I would say. Now I do more of just making things, you know, as my three-dimensional sketches, which I'll talk about in a bit. So the idea here is that I'm turning two rims onto a bowl, and this inner rim is this one here that continues right around and the outer one is out here. And so um, I have to cut it away and then sh shape this transition between the two. And I made some of these back in around 1975. So I was exploring sort of um, uh, doing things other than the norm. In other words, just straight turning uh, even uh, back then. And so this bowl um, has that same idea of the double rim. And, you know, there are some elements of this that relate to the carved tray that I did, kind of this organic kind of look. And, um, and I, I realized in looking back at my work and different things that I was trying to achieve in that this was an attempt to create this illusion as if this piece was bent back, you know, that it was molded somehow, like you could maybe do with clay 
Um, so, you know, giving it other characteristics, you know, and that kind of relates to the baseball bats, which I'll, I'll show in a bit. My early ex ex earliest experiments with multi-axis turning um, were back in 75 and 76. This was uh, an offset um, uh, platter that I did that had a wider rim. It was about this wide on this side. So I had the space to do this carving and then it tapered down to about that size on the other side. So I had to shape all this away um, to reveal this little carving uh, that I put in it. And then this was uh, just a kind of a one-off uh, idea, which was to turn a panel with sort of a half sphere on it. And then um, after it was turned to cut it into a rectangle and make a cove cut around the edge so that I could do a raised panel. But um, in this case, I moved the center over to turn some of this away too. So, you know, I'm closing in on about 50 years of experimenting with uh, multi-axis turning in general. Um, more recently, in the past 30 years is on spindle turning. So this is a cabinet that I made uh, using that idea. And this disc here was about three feet in diameter. And, um, and then there was another one three feet in diameter to do the two sides and another one for the back. And this was published in Fine Woodworking. I don't remember the year, but the piece was made in 76. And, you know, one of the things that I was, uh, that one is challenged with when trying to incorporate turning with furniture, you know, X, Y, Z uh, furniture, is that you're, you have round forms that you're trying to incorporate into those flat spaces. So, you know, there, there's kind of an interesting uh, effect on the side here. This could have all been hand-shaped, uh, but it was a whole lot easier to do it as a, as a turning. And um, so these are pure machined items, the way I look at it. It's a turning, and then it's, um, you know, cut out uh, this way, cut in half, and then a cove cuts run on the table saw. Another um, experiment that I did was with uh, what I call, uh, well, split turned legs. So it's, their paper joint glued together for four by fours. In this case, it's curly maple. And, um, you know, a, a straightforward form is turned. This is the cross section of it. It comes like this and it goes back out and then it comes down. And then I split them apart and actually set them up on, in a little V block on the bandsaw so that I can cut out some of these shapes. So what I'm attempting to do here is create another kind of illusion where it almost looks like shards of wood that have been, you know, ran, not randomly, but, you know, sort of, erratically um, connected, although it's a very strong uh, piece. It's, um, you know, uh, I would, uh, there's never gonna be an issue with it breaking because they are all single pieces of wood. In uh, 92, I was thinking about, maybe I could make a piece look bent. And this was the result. You know, I didn't really have an idea in mind. It was just sort of an idea in my head. Could I do this? thing, you know, make something look bad. And I did. And, and this was the piece. And then it was, okay, now what am I going to do with it? You know, so I didn't have a, a, a thought out idea in advance. And, um, you know, I recognize that there were some issues like this little piece in here, because this is on a different axis, it can't be just a, a nice smooth transition. So I decided to celebrate that some. And then I decided, well, I should make the base really big so that it's more stable. And my first thought was to make a candlestick. And um, uh, here it is. I mean, th these were some of the first ones that I did. And I had in the back of my mind, there was this other thing going on, which was the fact that um, the AAW had formed uh, six years previous in 86, I think it was. And um, although I felt as though I was you know, using turning, I was in this other world of the furniture, of furniture, and I just thought if I could make just a single object um, in wood on the lathe, that that would maybe get me entry into uh, the AAW, which worked out brilliantly. I was on the cover in 93 and invited to my first uh, AAW conference as a demonstrator. <clears throat> Here's a drawing of that of what's involved in the layout of that. And, you know, a lot of times I don't um, draw things out in advance. I mean, I'm trained as a furniture maker to draw everything out in advance, you know, or what's necessary and uh, the joinery and all that stuff. So I, you know, I have a pretty good engineering background from practical experience. I don't have an engineering degree, but I have an engineering from having worked in industry, which was a huge help to me. 
But um, so I, I just let it, things happen. And then I figure out, okay, now what did I do? And how can I, how can I duplicate that if I, if I want to do it? So my, my latest way to go about that is whenever I want to try something new, I take two blocks of wood, lay them both out the same, turn one. And if it works, I have my master for the next one. And if it doesn't work, I make another one. Uh, so I always have two, one that I'm playing with and the other. And, and the first one, if it doesn't turn out, and inevitably it's not exactly what I want, I take notes on it, on that piece of wood, move this back, this center should have been here, whatever necessary. And so I can, um, you know, uh, get my form the way I want it, rather than do something big and say, well, I wish that I had done this. You know, I work things out on a small scale first. I was very pleased to see this. Uh, this was after the UC Davis conference. Uh, Rick Mastelli, who was the editor of the journal, um, dubbed me the multi-axis Mahatma, which is a title that I will try to live up to. <laughs> um, here are some other iterations of that candlestick form with you know different kinds of effects. This one, this illusion that this piece is about to tip over, you know, so, sort of a precarious thing. And um, and this one had a center, you know, at an angle, and then this one obviously straight up. And I was careful about picking the grain so that the pool patterns would show up on this view. Now this one is a, also is a one-off one that uh, is much trickier because I'm I'm using a lot of different uh, axes to create different aspects of it. And I think from a a, a critique of a sculptural object, you know, a, a, a successful piece of sculpture in um, in the in the history books is about an object that you can rotate around and get some some new um, images that aren't apparent from the other views. And you know, I understand that. Um, but I will say that from my standpoint, I sort of feel like sometimes simpler is better. And you know, I'm not saying, you know, I like this one for for what I was able to accomplish with with it, but sometimes things can get maybe too complicated. You know, oftentimes I hear people talk about, well, I turned this on 65 centers. And, and my response oftentimes is, well, is it 65 times better? You know, it's kind of like, what is it that you're after? Who, who turns on the most axes? You know, that. So after that, my wife, who is, act, who is my best critic, um, said I can't, she couldn't wait to see how it was going to translate into furniture. And, and my feeling was, um, you know, this is it. This is, <laughs> I didn't think that I'd be moving on to uh, making furniture objects. So, uh, but I did, and, and these were the results, uh, first two results, which have very much the same um, geometry of the axes as the candlesticks. It doesn't appear that way, but, you know, because they are table legs. And actually the angle, you know, from inner top to outer bottom and inner bottom to outer top is the same in both of these. Um, but with very different effects. This one, I have straight lines, it's much more angular, it sort of has a spider look to it. And this one kind of rubbery, you know, like it's, it's moving, it's, it's fluid. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to create another illusion, which was that the legs do not have bilateral symmetry. And I made this one to have a table that has sort of the twisted effect and then it has a painted base and that's uh, Babinga. And related to that, um, in, on my shop wall, here's uh, one of the sample walls. There are two legs here, this one and this one. They are the same as the table you just saw. In fact, this is an exact duplicate extra leg that I made of the other one. And um, But I did this one first, and this is out of Poplar. And this was so handy for me to do, which was, you know, I could make these legs this leg and say, well, I could duplicate this. Well, it's kind of tricky because, you know, you got to figure out where the centers were right? By leaving the block at the top and bottom, I know where those centers are, and it just makes it all much more, much easier, okay? So this isn't the finished leg, this one is, but this is the one that has all the information that I need moving forward. And the rubbery need one, here it is, full block at the bottom and top, and I can set it on the lathe and turn it if I, you know, turn it on slow and then put it on the other axis and know exactly how I got there. Oftentimes these legs are four by four, in the, but in the end, there's nothing bigger than two inch. This is another effect using multi-axis turning. 
um, where I'm turning the whole thing on different centers. So it's sort of a bead shape on one side and it's a bead shape on, shape on the other, but they're offset from one another. So it's creating this other kind of illusion. Interestingly, on this one, I um, made a model both for my own uh, information and, and to show the client. And I just screwed it together. And when I did that, I, I realized that I could rotate the legs. And so I did that. They're angled at a 45 to one another. So here you see it from the side view and there from the front. And as you move around it, they flip. This is the front and that's the side. It wasn't my intention that that's what I was doing, you know, helping my design process, but it was just one of those fluky things that happened. And I thought, oh, that looks pretty cool. So that became, you know, how I, I I finished that project. <laughs> That's me with uh, kind of grimacing there because this thing is resting on a muscle on my, <laughs> I don't know what muscle that is, but you know, it's a pretty heavy bat. Um, this was a demonstration piece that I did uh, when teaching at Bucks County Community College, uh, which was two things. One, it was a six foot long green piece of ash, which is, if you've ever turned ash, you know that it's springy. I mean, that's why it's used for bats. But when it's green, it's even more springy. And so it was like, how do you stabilize it so that you can finish the turning? And then I steam bent it. And that was my finished thing. Um, uh, this is uh, as... Uh, John might have uh, relayed to you the uh, Cooperstown, the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown uh, just acquired a set of my bats for their permanent collection, which was a huge thrill for me. Um, and I want you to notice this squiggle in the handle. I'm, I'm going to refer to that as, you know, a lot of these ideas cross over from one another, and I take details from this and put it in that. Um, here's a drawing I did for the layout of the centers for the bat. And you know, for me, the important thing here, aside from this dent looking like a ball hit it, was this little deflection on the backside. So once again, I'm, I'm taking wood, which is a, you know, very rigid material. It's not clay and it's not glass uh, and giving it these other characteristics. You know, it's interesting uh, in thinking about other crafts. If you, if you want to major or take a class in ceramics or glass, your goal initially is to try to make one that's perfectly round. And that's a hard thing to do. Whereas in turning, it will absolutely be perfectly round. There's no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It will be round. And so, you know, I try to I push it in the other direction where it has these other um, characteristics. That's Josh Roach, the uh, president of the Hall of Fame with the bats that are, that are installed there now. So I'm quite thrilled about that. Um, <clears throat> Irv Lipton was a big uh, collector. Um, he had a huge collection of turned objects and he saw my bats. The original ones I did were in ash and he um, said, oh, I want one out of exotic woods. And I'm like, oh my gosh, where am I going to find a four by four of pink ivory, for instance? So I, I thought, well, I can just make them different lengths and, you know, create sort of a graphic uh, look. And this is the set that he got. He passed away in his... Um, his estate gifted them to the Museum of Art and Design in New York. And I'm always playing with different ideas of um, different approaches. This one's a um, single bat that uh, it has this head scratcher effect to most turners. Like, how do you do this? How do you turn this? Because if you turn this and the end is over here, you no longer have the center for this end of it, right? So what I've figured out to do, um, and I'll explain this pretty quickly here, um, that I just took a, a drawing of a straight bat, cut it in half and angled them into one another at a pretty specific angle because this had to flip around the uh, tailstock and, um, and taped them together and that became my template. So I, this I wanted to turn between centers. So it comes down like this and it continues on. And then there was just a little flat here so that I could put it between centers. And then this one comes down this way and there's a little flat here. So the wood was just a little bit wider and it allowed me to flip back and forth from one to the other to get these pretty much completely done. And then this was done afterwards and shaped. So I mentioned that squiggle before that was in the handle. And this is, you know, like how ideas um, develop for me. Like I'm not, 
I had this piece and I thought, what if I just made it kind of wiggly on one side to smooth on the other? And in my sketchbook, it kind of looked like a handle. I thought that's what I was doing. And then I turn it and then it ends. This is the first one. This is about eight inches tall and it looked like a figure. The proportions weren't quite right, but I thought, huh, the figure. So 1997 became the year of the figure for me. The first one's being bilaterally symmetrical, you know, so if you were to take this and cut it in half, the left and right are the same, and here it is from the side view. I didn't really make that many that were symmetrical because I had this other idea. What would it look like if, could I make a figure look like it was twisting? And if I can make it look twisting, can I also turn the head and tilt the head? And so I figured out how to do the layout of that so that it, um, it created that effect, right? So the back lower half of the figure is on one set of centers and the other upper is on a different so that you're, you're getting the read of this thing. These shoulders are tilted this way, but the hips are tilted the other way. Um, but this is all a smooth surface. So these started to grow in size also. This is about four feet high and this one's six feet high. So it was a balance between um, creativity, sort of the art side of things, and the mathematical side. And I, those are like two of my strengths are math and, and, um, and the creative side. And sometimes I, I think that I need to let, not let engineering or the math side get in the way before I really figure out an idea. And then it's time to, okay, now I'll let engineering in, come in because that will start to dictate things going in a different direction, you know, based on the facts or whatever. Um, and uh, that's worked well for me. Uh, I feel sometimes I cut myself off from the creativity if I start engineering it too quickly. So I did no drawings for these things. I just had a general idea of what was happening. The next two slides are this figure, which again is about five feet um, tall. So there it is mounted on the lathe. The front side is here, you, it's already been turned. Now I'm doing the back side. And here it is on the tailstock, right, on the wood. But up here, the center is like right about here. So it's off the wood completely. So I, I took this, I bolted on, uh, looks like two pieces of two, four by fours, bolted all this together, put a piece of plywood on the end of it. This is actually a counterbalance, not a very good one, but you know, to allow this thing to spin a little bit more freely. And then, um, you know, and one thing also I want to say about this is that once this thing starts to turn, once it gets rounded, right, it'll be uh, 12 inches of the tool touching the wood, and then three feet of airspace, and then one foot of touching, and then three feet of airspace. So it's, you know, this whole notion of rubbing the bevel, I don't get, I'm not allowed to do that, because if I do that and put pressure on the bevel, that thing's going to come around, I'm going to have a big chunk taken out. So it's bevel touching, not bevel rubbing. And I'm so glad that I took this photo, um, it, cause it shows so much, you know, it, it, pretty wacky, pretty wild looking, you're seeing right through it. And it's like, how can you stand in front of this thing? And, you know, I, I was certainly very careful and, and I'm very aware and safety conscious of doing it, but I set up my tool rest. So it's where it needs to be. And I know that I'm just working on that 10 inches or so. And then once that's done, while it's off, I'll move this. No moving of the tool rest unless the things, um, you know, stopped completely. <clears throat> Illusion and animation, another direction, you know, taking a common object, uh, bowling pin, and how do you make it? How do you animate it? Well, by bending them, you know, this is bent to this. And also this is, uh, there's one set of centers to do this part, one to do this part, and there's shaping in between. If you look at the back of this, do you see how flat this curve is compared to the inside? So this is not a pure turning. There is handwork that needs to be done to create, finish that illusion. But what is happening is that this axis and this axis are crossing right there, right? So that, you know, this, this would actually flare out and there would be material in there. And then the last one is, um, if, if this were only turned on two axes, the base would be standing straight up and then it would be bent over. And I wanted to give it kind of this hip action. So there's another center in there uh, in between the two that allows me just to turn the bottom of it.
um, the, my vessel forms. I've, I've never turned a traditional hollow vessel. I, I haven't done a lot of things, but I've never done uh, any vessels until I did these. I, I had been demonstrating in in uh, Jean Francois's uh, well, it was it was his shop at the time in France, and I really got interested in going to the grocery store and seeing all this stuff uh, that I, I couldn't read French, but it was just interesting labels of objects. And so my vessels became, you know, the throwaway vessels of bottles, jars, and cans. And then I started to uh, illustrate them. And so, you know, I had done painting before and graphic design and lots of different things in my, in high school and, and, even in college, but once I got into wood, I stopped all that stuff completely. So it was a way to kind of get back to it. So fromage whiz was my first uh, idea and uh, cheese whiz, which when I took it back the next year, they just thought this was kind of stupid. Although I did bring some cheese whiz with me and they were happy about it. They were like, oh, this is really interesting, which floored me. But the thing is that the French won't import two things, cheese or, um, wine because they're just going to eat and drink their own i mean they they na their neighbor is italy and they in france you cannot find parmesan cheese because that's italian so but what was interesting about this is that they they the people that tried it had never tasted um cheddar before because it's not a french thing so so i was on to something <laughs> And this is another one that um, I, I was, you know, it's kind of a funny lager lager, but um, one of the things that I was pleased about this was the color uh, combinations. And, you know, there's a lot of different strategies of how to use color. Um, and, you know, you can take a stab in the dark and hope that it works out or whatever. But one, one strategy is you take a light, a dark and a bright. So here we have an off-white, a deep, deep purple called Payne's gray and, um, this uh, bright red, pyroli red. And this whole thing is painted in just those three colors. So here they are as pure colors there, there, and there. But I mix them to get the browns for this and the log and, you know, the ear rings and the sapwood and all that kind of stuff. So I, I was just pleased with the way that that um, came out. And where do ideas come from? Well, I go to this butcher and he had, well, here you see four heads, but he had about 15 of these heads around the top of the shop, uh, his, uh, shop. And I just couldn't figure out why you would have so many heads. You know, why would you, you know, I'm not a hunter, but if I were, I might have one, right? <laughs> and hang it over my mantle or something. But he seemed to have every one. And I, I, I always kind of was wondering about that. And then one day I came in and he was talking to this guy about the third one down that I think it was this one that he had gone up to Saskatchewan and walked two miles into the woods and that's where he shot it. And then he had to drag it back out and bring it back home. And I'm like, oh, now I get it. It's the story as much as the head itself. So I created my own um, stories about uh, this new series, this more you know series I started then called Game Hunting in North America, and it's about places that I've been or imagined um, hunting for that elusive animal or piece of wood. So, and I kind of like this is in my house how they're displayed uh, at right angles to each other too. So that's this just sort of grows. The more recent ones I I make a few of each and sell the other ones, but I always keep one for myself. Um, <clears throat> this was an idea that I, uh, this is dated 2012, it was probably around 2006, I was just messing around on the lathe trying something and I came up with this basic idea of, of turning a bunch of spheres and then carving them and, and I thought, huh, that's kind of cool, uh, but I just didn't have the time to explore it back then, so I just put it aside. And then I was cleaning my shop once and came across them and I'm like, oh, well, let me see if I can do something with that. And this was a piece I did for uh, Wharton Eschrick exhibition called Poplar Culture. That's actually Poplar from, from the museum grounds. And, um, and it's the first time I sort of fleshed out this idea. Um, if you go to my website, you can see the whole process of this. There's a video about a column that I did, which I'll show you in a second. Um, and, you know, it was just kind of a neat little thing. I mean, this has been carved in here and also hand shaped there. And each one is sort of turned at right angle to the next one. 
And then I got a commission for a table and I could do it on a slightly bigger so scale, but I really wanted to scale it up bigger. So I did this one. I don't know if you can hear that. This is a uh, white pine, 11 inch uh, by 11 inch. a lot of it. And that's uh, overall 12 feet. The turning itself, uh, the wood itself is um, 10 and a half. So, uh, but again, there's a link to that if you go to my website under articles and there's videos and it has a little clip uh, of it. Many things start off as small sketches, 3D sketches. You know, I could make a ton of these and then I'll, I, well, which I've done. I mean, I've made like 20 and then I look at them and then I wait a few days, look at them and then critique them and throw away half of them. You know, the ones that are just kind of noise, I just throw away and I keep the ones that I think have an idea. So this is only, you see the um, calipers here, it's only like two inches high, but this is like the germ of the ideas right there. And I did this, which is kind of a section of the column that you just saw. And after a while, I thought, well, what else could I do with that? And I thought, well, if I left the angle here and then put it this way too, it would be asymmetrical. And this one now, I like a lot more than that one. But this wouldn't have come about if I didn't do that first. Then I had this other idea of doing a cube inside of two half spheres. Conceptually, I think, easy enough to understand. but. So I did this model and I thought that looks too big for this. So I thought, oh, I'll make it smaller. So then I did this and thought, no, that's too small. So then I did this one. And this is the one that I took with me to the uh, World Wood Day in Long Beach, California in 2017. And they had a piece of uh, uh, Western yellow cedar for me there, 12 by 12 by I don't know, 18 inches high or something like that. And I made it uh, during that session. So. It's kind of a cool thing to do. A lot of these like that requires carving and I do all the carving on the lathe, which with spindle lock is just wonderful. This is a, a detail of uh, where this whole idea with the spheres has gone. So, you know, the tilting is now on these, this is about a five foot uh, overall height uh, piece. And this is just a little section of it in ash. One of my last classes teaching at Bucks was a carving class. And each week I'd come in with a different uh, one of these carvings that sort of have this egg shape in them. And um, and it took me a few years before I decided what I was gonna do to finish them. And I went with this painting technique. Um, Western yellow cedar is a wonderful wood to carve. It's great. It's hard enough, it holds edge detail. And um, so this is a tray, no turning at all, but done nearly 100% on the lathe. So I just leave stems on the end and use a safe center and I can carve it, rotate it. You know, when you have your regular shapes, for instance, made on the lathe, you it's so hard to clamp it once you take it off. So I just do it all um, right there. Um, I'm preparing for an exhibition, which has been put off until 2024 called La Familia, and this is the Ellis Islanders. And I have about 30 of these different figures that are turned and carved. Another series, a family tree, which sort of is like a three-dimensional photograph. In my shop, I keep relevant models for shaping, uh, for reference, uh, for, for painting and for form. And this one I wanted to show, this is a, a detail of a bench that I made, but this one is a, the first bench that I made. And I got this uh, commission from Yale University uh, Art Gallery. They wanted a, a bench for public seating, but they wanted me to do a sketch. And I was, you know, I can draw, but uh, I also like to be creative when I'm turning. So to commit to something, it's not gonna be as, as kind of wonky as what I could actually do. So what I did was um, I made this model and then I drew that. <laughs> so here's that piece figured out. Let me just go back for a second. And here's a, um, this piece of wood here is the actual ash. And there's 
the block where the mortise and tenon is, and here's the shaped sphere. Because I I figured that the most important part of the turning was right below where the mortise and tenon was to make sure it was strong enough here. Up above it, it's you know it's a uh, armrest. It's not going to get the kind of abuse that the underneath does. So that's that's this is the finished piece. Um, I also do two-dimensional work. I do lots of different things. This is a block print that I did and 18 by 24 uh, graphite drawing from observation, which means I'm looking at trees when I, when I drew this. And I started teaching drawing classes for art majors. This was another one that's, it's a leaf that's all kind of gnarled up. And um, that's a 20, 18 by 24 large drawing. Um, and these are assignments that I gave my students. So before that, I, I would do the assignments myself. Oil pastel, scary bear, watercolor pencil, salivating dog. This one's not obviously from observation, but it's how I envisioned a strike, you know, from a close up position. <clears throat> uh, Robert Beck is a contemporary. Uh, my favorite contemporary Bucks County painter, and he painted me in my shop. And I, I just, I really felt like he captured exactly what it feels like um, to be there. And uh, so that was a fun thing. We made a trade, one of my bats for the painting. Um, the last two things, I or three things I want to show are, uh, this is the Wharton Eshrick Museum. That's what's in Paoli, Pennsylvania. This is the studio where Eshrick um, uh, lived and um, it's just chock full of his his uh, work. Um, very little turning, a lot of carving, a lot of furniture, and um, this is I think about an hour from where you are. And I would highly recommend organizing a trip to go see this place. It's just mind boggling. I, I've um, I've probably been there a hundred times. It's just well worth the visit. If you're not familiar with his work, go to my website. I've written articles about him for Woodwork Magazine and there's some videos. You can just watch some of the uh, talks that I've given about him. Here are a couple of his pieces, uh, beautiful carved uh, bowl, uh, his three-legged stools, which if he had a production item, this was it. Um, and then this is a, his hammer handle chair, which he bought uh, pieces from, uh, a hammer factory. I think they were gone out of business, three barrels full of hammers. And he just thought, geez, these are already shaped. I can make chairs out of them. So they've become quite uh, valuable objects now. He was born in 1887 and he died in 1970. Um, and he started working in wood in the 1920s. And the last plug I want to give is for the uh, Center for Art and Wood in Philadelphia, um, a great place to visit. Um, they have nice exhibitions there, and the second floor is uh, their permanent collection, which you can walk through. Um, my exhibition is actually going to be there. Uh, you can mark your calendars, November 1st, 2024. <laughs> it's two years off. It was supposed to be this year, but with COVID, it changed all that. So that's what I have to say. So if you want to open it up, I'm going to leave this set up so that if anybody wants to talk about any pieces, I can do that or, you know. Let's see. Can you guys see Mark as well? Yes. I can see all of you for questions. So uh, let's go. Questions and comments. Anybody? Ken Vasco. Yeah. Hi. Great presentation. Thank you. Uh, like on the inchworm, uh, that wood is just gorgeous. First off, can you tell? Can you explain a little bit about the wood and where it came from? Uh, yeah, it's a nice piece of wood. Um, I think it's, uh, like blister maple. I, I, I don't tell you the truth. I don't remember where I got it. I'm always looking for interesting wood. I could have gotten it from, uh, Hearn. I could have gotten it from, uh, someplace out, or I might've gotten it at one of the, the you know, AAW conferences, people bring wood and, uh, I had to have looked at it. So it was probably Hearn or uh, it could have been out in the West Coast too. I, I, I just can't recall, but I had it, you know, it was just gorgeous and I had to get it. That's the only thing I've made out of it. <laughs> I was interested in the joinery for the stools. We were talking about that when we did our, our test run the other day. I still don't quite understand how you 
get the square you start with a big piece and you wind up with a square section that has mortises in it i don't know what the, what the order of events is to make those joints um are you talking about like this yes okay so um the model is very helpful for me because I, I sort of, you know, I draw enough so that I can figure something out. Like I need to draw in the mortise and ten the mortises and tenons and get all that stuff figured out first, which you can't see in this picture. But and then um, the piece of wood is square. You know, it's a four by four square, and I lay out the joints and um, I make them. You know, I I have a mortiser, um, slot horizontal slot mortiser, and I make the joints and then. Um, knowing full well that I'm going to be turning it, but, uh, and I'm very aware. I mean, the only issue might be is if you, uh, if you are putting a center that's directly over a mortise and there's not much distance above it, that you might crush it, but it hasn't been an issue uh, for me. You know, like here's one, it comes all the way to the inside corner here. So the mortise is, it's, it's on either side of where the mortises are. Um, and then you can see here, this is the turn portion of it. And then this is hand shaped from that point up. Do you see that? Like, actually I reduced it, I took it down to here. So it almost looks like it's drifted away from the, uh, the block at the top. And I save the cutoff. When I bandsaw this thing off, I save it so I can use it as a clamp block because they're angled. My make the mortises when it's a four by four and then yes. do the turning while it's still a four by four and then carve it away. So you end up with a two by two block that has yeah. more than them where you want them. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and these, a lot of these are things I figure out with this model, you know, if it doesn't work out, I've got to make another model. Right. Um, and, and my mortises, I don't have meat. I have them one shorter than the other, like an eighth of an inch. I leave an eighth inch wall between them. And I never glue up a table with all four rails and all four legs. I do it in three glue ups. I glue one direction, you know, two legs, one rail, two legs, one rail. And then the final is, is the other way, just so I can, you know, make all my adjustments and get it. So it's, you know, everything's lined up. And then I'll make the more, the, uh, the rail piece going into the leg. I make it so that the rail can be up a 16th or down a 16th. So I have distance there, a little bit of slop. So once I clamp the thing together, I can tap it down or tap it up to get it so it's perfectly flush on the top. There's, it's such a pain in the neck to clean up that up any other way. So I make it so it's, you know, the top of the leg is the correct thing. You know, that's the final resting spot. Questions, comments, anybody else? I have a question. This is Ernie Conover. Um, where do you find some of the very big dimensions of wood? The only place I've ever found is Erian, but uh, you may have other sources. Um, I'm always on the lookout for large pieces, uh, and I got, have gotten them in all different places. And I've been, you know, doing this stuff for so many years that I've saved up things. I've got some giant eight by eight, free of center um, walnut, you know, that happened to be in a in a uh, warehouse that had been closed down from a wood shop from 50 years before. And I'm like, oh, this is, <laughs> this is pretty nice. The biggest wood, um, I did commit, not commission, but had a, a mill cut up this, um, these uh, 12 by 12s out of pine for me. And, um, you know, but they're, they were green. I mean, I, I really don't like buying green wood just because I want wood in my shop that I can use for anything that I want. Now, if it's a piece of sculpture, it might not matter so much if it's perfectly dry, but if it's a piece of furniture, it does matter. So I'm not the kind that really uh, does this very often. Now, th in this case, they all have the centers in them, you know, but, and I just expect that they will have cracks and I, I don't, you know, but um, so it's just different different places that I've come across. The, these came from uh, Western Pennsylvania. Um, I got some beautiful four inch, I got a four inch thick by about 18 inch wide piece of German pear wood from this place out in um, uh, Portland. 
can't think of the name of it. It's a pretty big lumber yard. Uh, can't quite think of the name. Anyway, I got this and it was just such a special piece and I love pear wood. And, um, and I used a little bit of it and it was sort of in the back of the pile. And then I thought, okay, now I want to use more of it. And I dug the piece out and it was just riddled with wormholes. And that was that, you know, but it seems like pear wood is, I don't know, sweet or something. And then uh, bugs get uh, drawn to it. There's a place near Reading um, that, uh, you know, I, I'm not thinking of the name off the top of my head, but a guy who, who does, uh, Cal what? Cal who? Calarico. No, no, it's this other guy. Um, I can't think of his name, but he, uh, he's an engineer and he figured out a way to keep Holly white, which was that he vacuum dries it because it's the moisture in the wood that does the staining and makes it gray. And so he figured out a way to dry it by vacuuming out the moisture. And, uh, and he had like one inch, two inch, and I even got some three by threes of it. I'll get you that name later. I just can't think of him off the top of my head. He charges a fair amount for it, but um, you know, if you like Holly, it was just a, a great find. How do you move these huge pieces of wood around? I moved them all by myself. <laughs> the biggest, the hardest part was getting them off the truck and onto here because they said they were kiln dried. Well, they, and that they would weigh about 350 pounds. Well, they ended up, uh, I don't know if it was twice that, but it seemed that, and um, we just had a couple of people and slid them, you know, I, and my table saw was covered with, I had four of these beams and then I took a chainsaw and started cutting them into smaller sections. So easier to, to move around. One is left in its full length here, uh, 12 feet, which I'm hoping that I can just turn that by itself. You know, when I did this column, this 12 foot column, that was kind of an interesting thing. I called my lumber yard and I, oh, sorry, I'm trying to find a picture of that. Um, and I, this local lumber person, I said, look, I'm looking for a 12 by 12 by 12 feet. Uh, piece of wood and he said hold on a second he went out to his shop or went out into the yard and he found he said I got one that's 11 feet long and I said okay I'll do that actually it was 11 by 11 by 11 feet and um, so um, this is white pine and and he, you know it seems like the options for big pieces are either oak or white pine or Douglas fir well these things in oak or Douglas fir would have weighed a ton and this one, one other person and myself, we could hoist it onto the lathe and set it up. And um, and at the end of the day, when I would be turning, um, I thought, well, I'm only, I'm concerned that this thing's going to sag. So I actually shimmed it up so it was arched up just a little bit, you know, maybe a half inch. So when I came back the next day, I knocked that out and then could continued turning. And in th this piece started out as at 11 inches and it finished at. 10 and three quarter. I lost a quarter of an inch over a 10 and a half foot long piece. And I was pretty impressed with that. What are you using for centers to support that great weight? Um, well, this, the problem with white pine is it's so soft that you can't uh, turn, but you know, with live center, right? So, because it just keeps crushing, it just, they keep moving in because it's so soft. So I ended up using um, a face plate on the bottom with uh, GRK screws, those like six inch long. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're the best. I, I use those for a lot of things. They're for decking and all that kind of stuff. But GRK, they're my favorite. And I use them for furniture too. And I screwed that in on the bottom. And on the top of it, which was at the tailstock, I used my live center. Um, but I, uh, I, I glued on a block of maple to, so I'm putting the center on the piece of maple. So I had a piece about four inches in diameter that I had a couple little screws in and then could put the center on that. Um, so that's that's how I did that. Thank you. John Chalikian. Yes, uh, your, your stuff is beautiful. And uh, I was wondering, are, are you still teaching at, Buc at Bucks County? No, no. I retired in 2017 after 37 years. I taught a couple of extra classes, but uh, I'm not teaching there anymore. They do have, they, they have a turning class there. Um, 
you know, they still offer the turning classes. Janine Wang is the teacher. She actually went to Rhode Island School of Design too. And, you know, I, I'd recommend it. It's a great shop. It's, if you're nearby, it's, uh, they have uh, eight one-way lathes, one with a double, you know, bed extension. It's really a well-equipped shop. It's set up for turning as well. I remember. Yeah, turning and all furniture. All yeah. Bays. Bay, yeah. Bay, you know. Yeah, we got a big grant from Wingate and I uh, upgraded all the equipment there about, I don't know, 15 years ago or something. Okay, thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Questions, comments? And, and one other thing, I, I'm, I assume that you all live not in Bucks County, but um, it's considered a, a state program because there aren't other wood programs at a community college. So you can actually, if you register as a wood major, come for in-county rates. I think as senior citizens, we can audit classes too. Um, yeah, you can audit classes. You still have to pay tuition. Uh, <laughs> don't have to have prerequisites. Well, they have uh, the prerequisites. I mean, it depends. A basic wood class, there's no prerequisite. A basic turning class, there's no prerequisites. But if you have, you know, if you want the advanced turning class, then you need the prerequisite, unless, you know, you could talk to the instructor and, you know, work something out. But when you have some of those things going around that are radically off center, have you ever taken a hit from those or caught, had a tool catch in there and fly up in the air? And... No. <laughs> Short answer. I will say that I had a major um, uh, incident when I was in college. Uh, you know, back then we didn't have variable speed lathes. It was like you turn the machine on and hope for the best. And if it started walking, you'd try to turn it off and then move it to the next belt down. So, uh, but I was doing these kind of, I don't have a picture of it here, but I was doing these uh, uh, pieces for a, um, for chairs, I did a um, six chairs for my thesis and each of the rails was turned. So I, I had a piece of plywood um, about two feet in diameter, scrap wood on either side and this uh, rail that was bolted on through the tenons. So I cut the tenons first and then I wanted to faceplate turn the, the shape of the, the rail. And there was one time where, where I learned a lot, which was that I guess the whole, I was, skimping on the plywood a little bit and they were very close to the end and the thing I'm standing in front of the lathe that's spinning this way and this thing it's just like a two by four that came flying out hit the floor put a big dent in it went flying in for end and smashed into somebody's uh, tool cabinet that they had made fortunately it was a day when there was uh, a field trip and I was the only one in the shop because it would have killed somebody I think and um and Ever since then, I'm like so careful about, you know, what I do and what I'm willing to stand in front of and how I would do things, you know, uh, figuring all that stuff out is extremely important to me. And I, I've never had anything um, happen since. And that was, you know, 45 years ago. Chilikian again? Yeah. Um, what speeds are you turning these? You know, like the 11 foot uh, object and then some of your other ones, your baseball bats, what kind of speeds or do you turn at? Um, the simple answer is I turn as fast as possible without the machine vibrating. So it really depends how offset it is. You know, sometimes I'm turning ridiculously slow, but if I turn it any faster, the machine's shaking. You know, I have the machine bolted down and, and things are a whole lot easier now and you can go faster than you used to be able to so it really comes down and I, I don't really look at it it's just kind of i started off a little on the slow side and then i think okay this is working out fine so then i'll speed it up some so i can't give you an exact answer it depends on the amount of offset how big the piece is and um you, you know you're staying just under where it starts to vibrate and wreck and wreck. yeah yeah i mean basically the faster the better you're going to get a cleaner cut so but sometimes because of the offset, I, um, I'm forced to turn it slower than I would like. But, you know, that's, I, I don't mean to be avoiding your question, but that's, you know. That's the best answer. 
That's, yeah, no, it's, it's it's good advice. You know, maybe maybe Thanks. something. If I'm turning a bad, I mean, you could turn that at two thousand or twenty five hundred. But if, but once I offset it, then it's like okay, it's so offset that um, I just crank it way down to say five hundred, and then maybe I'll get up to eight or nine or maybe twelve or fifteen. But I just can't be anywhere near it is when it's pretty much a balanced straight piece of wood. Almond. Okay, I've seen your bats at um, the Michener Museum in Do Doylestown, yep. and um, I was looking at those things and said, "How did you do that?" <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, do you have lathes that that you can spin something that's three feet? What kind of uh, between centers? At yeah, yeah. Well, the one way is I can turn 10 feet if I want, but the biggest that's, that's, How about diameter? Oh, diameter. Um, well, they're not that offset. I mean, I, you know, have to, the, the one way is uh, an early one. So it's 20, 20 inch throw. It's not the 24, but the, the um, um, robust is, I think it's 25 or 24, something like that. 26, I don't know. So 25, I think. Um, so I design around what I'm capable of doing, you know, so I, obviously I have to think about that. I can have an idea of what I want to do, but then I might have to re reduce it back because it's not achievable. Okay. Some of those bats, do you carve them? Well, it depends on which one. Uh, the one that looks like it got hit by a ball, that's all turned. I have to clean it up by hand, you know, it's, it's, I, I can't sand it when it's a, a section of a round. Um, so, and I, and I, the edges are real important to me. So I do that by hand. I've gotten, you know, pretty quick at doing that. There's one where the ball is passing through it. There's a little bit right. of on that. The one that has a knot in it. I mean, that's, that's all carved, you know, and that one takes as long as all the other ones put together. You know, I had this idea that I could turn a piece and then bend it into a knot. <laughs> well, I could bend it a little bit, but um, so then I thought, well, I have to carve it and it's a simple thing and not, but to try to visualize that when you're looking at a block of wood, it's, it's tricky to, so oh. I take a piece of cord, like rubber cord and tied it into a knot so I could look at it from the different views and start to carve. And the, I remember every time I do it, it's like, okay, I, this has to do this, this has to come around here and it looks awful until finally it's starting to get where it needs to go. And then you, it's clear to you what, or what clear to me what I have to do to make it, to, to finish that illusion. And, um, you know, uh, a lot of times, not just about carving, but turning is that the first one takes the longest and looks the worst and then you figure it out, you know? So then as you, as you do more, it gets better, you know? And, and, you know, so a lot of times I'll do, uh, many things are not just one-offs. Like when I do a set of bats, I'll do three or four sets at a time. And then I'll have, you know, if I have a commission for one, I'll make three or four and then um, have them for the future. And uh, and then I change up the designs um, with each one. Might have a different species of wood. It might have a new design. So I'd say I'd probably, there's probably about 20, 20, 25 different designs, but three of them I always use. And then I'll pick, you know, some other ones that are intriguing me to me. You know, one of my, uh, one thing I would say about what I do is that, um, you know, I'm trained as an artist, I'm trained as a maker and as a creative person coming up with ideas. And um, I try to be as creative as I can, like I'll change things up from day to day, you know, and always have different ideas. And it keeps me fresh and it keeps me focused and uh, pleased with new directions. There are many people that they're trained and figure out how to make something and do it really well. And then they just stick with it. And that's what they do because that's their signature work. And they'll just do that because that's what they're known for. From a marketing standpoint, that makes a whole lot more sense than what I do. Cause I have to you know, it's like a new sales pitch because I'm doing something else, right? So, um, you know, I'm pleased that there are certain things that I do that have appeal, but it's not, 
I, but I also appreciate being able to do different things. So I keep changing um, throughout my career and I don't see that that will ever change. So it's, that's appealing to me as a creative person. Maybe not the best marketing solution. <laughs> that's, that's what I do. Well, on that note, we're, uh, we're on the hour. And uh, Mark, I want to thank you very much for a very interesting and challenging hour. Uh, you could give me a ton of ideas that I probably will never have time to get to, but I could fantasize. And uh, I really appreciate seeing your work. It's, it's fantastic. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being here and uh, hope you all got something out of it. And uh, I look forward to looking a lot of, at a lot of other um, coffee. What is this called? Coffee hours. Uh, coffee hours, yeah. That's every week. I'll give you a hand of applause. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Thank you, Mark. Great Thanks, job. Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Mark and John. Thank you, Paul. Okay, we're going to end the hour now. Thanks a lot. I can find it. <laughs> Yeah. Add her up. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. You, Mark from the UK. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, John. Thank you, Enjoyed thank you. it. See you all next week. And good remembrance yeah. day for tomorrow. Yeah. Yes. Wood shop. Thank God for wood.